Would you consider yourself a high level entrepreneur? Now, most likely if you're listening to this, you definitely are. And what I've heard over and over and over again is it's hard to find like-minded people that are like that too. Again, I'm from Maine, so I totally understand how difficult it can be. Thank goodness I have an amazing online community, so I know tons of them. And that is exactly why we are starting this brand new mastermind group with high-level like-minded entrepreneurs, the ones that you know you can go alongside with that will help move you to the next level, let alone with kick butt coaching from me because I like to slap you around both on focus and on strategy. So if you're looking to double or triple this year, which I know most of you are, I want you to go ahead and apply and see if it's a good fit for you. I will totally tell you if it's not and if I wouldn't do it if I were you, uh, but go to eventualmillionaire.com slash apply. We are looking for amazing like-minded entrepreneurs. My previous mastermind members have told me it is life changing. So take the time today, fill out the very quick application and we'll see if it's a fit. Take care. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and I am so excited to have my good friend on the show, Greg Mercer. He runs Jungle Scout, and if you haven't heard of it yet, you have to go check it out. Plus, the growth of his company is insane. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Greg. Jamie, thank you very much for having me on. It's going to be a fun time chatting with you. Yeah. Okay. So because I have a million questions. I told you this before when I was hanging out with you guys, like you, the growth that you've created was insane. So take us from the beginning of Jungle Scout to where you are now. And so everybody can also have a jaw dropping moment also. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I used to work a real job. I quit that to start selling physical products on Amazon. And I started Jungle Scout as like a little bit of like a, a side hustle or a hobby project. Like my Amazon business was doing quite well. And I wanted to be mindful of not getting distracted, but I did have this need in the software space. So I was like, why don't I just try to create this? Like if I could sell enough of this to break even on the cost to get it developed, I was going to consider it a win. Um, fast forward all the way to today, about four and a half years later, uh, we have like 225,000 customers. There's 125 people that work here at Jungle Scout. And uh, yeah, it exceeded my wildest expectations. But of course, there was a lot of challenges and bumps in the road uh, in that middle part there that we just fast forwarded through. <laughs> right. That's why I love interviews like this. It's like, it was great. Everything was fine. No big deal. Yeah. So of course, we're going to break just, that you know, down. It just happens naturally. <laughs> no stress at all. It was great. Uh, and that's, I guess, my point. Because when, when people are really going in and going, oh, I want to create a little software thing too. Oh, I'm going to dabble in this. And, and you hit on something. Fast growth can also be <laughs> insane, especially if you don't have the skill set. So can you walk me through a little bit when you realized that it was a big deal and started taking off a little bit more? Yes. I remember, like the day that I launched it, I had just built up a really small email. list was like 100 people and uh, 12 of those people bought it. So I was like, okay, like 12% conversion rate from like a, mm, not really that well qualified email list. I was like, all right, that's actually pretty good, but I don't know if I can really get anyone else to buy this thing. And I acquired a few more customers from a few different marketing channels. I think the first one that started to pick up a little bit of traction was doing actually like webinars and teaching people about uh, the, essentially like these algorithms, this data that I created around Amazon, how they could use that to help their business. That was the first one that kind of started to pick up. And uh, I'm telling you that part of the story because it was very like for the first six months, I was trying to be really mindful that my physical products business was doing quite well. It was growing uh, quickly. It was profitable. Like I had a clear path ahead of like growing that into like the, the business of my dreams. So it was like, man, I, you know, I have to be pretty careful with this stuff. Uh, so I was working, you know, five or 10 hours a week, maybe on Jungle Scout. And each week, uh, you know, we we're starting to just acquire more customers and more customers and more customers. Then they got to a point where it's like, man, maybe I should start taking this a little bit more seriously. And I remember there was kind of two aspects of that for me. One aspect was uh, at the time, like the monetary reasons, like, okay, I wonder, you know, how much this could grow or how profitable it could be. But then probably what was more important for me at the time actually was like, what sounds more fun for me? And I'd been selling physical products on Amazon at that point for like five years. I 
it was just like pretty easy for me. Like I knew what to expect. I've developed a system that I could like easily replicate for launching new products. And it wasn't very challenging. Whereas this whole software thing, I'm not a developer, never created software. The marketing was totally different. So it was like this cool, fun, exciting challenge. So I, so I think about like six months in after launching it is when I was like, okay, instead of working five or 10 hours a week, I'm going to devote like 50% of my time or 75% of my time to this for like a few months and see what happens. Okay. I love all of this, especially because software is not your main thing, but you have like a background in civil engineering. Did any of that transfer over? Like, were you geeky and enough to do software? Cause some people jump in software and they, I mean, I came from that world and to see people jump into it that have no clue, they get smacked around a lot. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about your experience. Yeah. So definitely very like analytical and data driven type person. Uh, part of that was, you know, kind of like the engineering background. I also in college, you know, took a few programming type classes. But we're talking about like MATLAB or Visual Basic or creating macros oh, yeah. or things like that. <laughs> Sorry, I get yeah. excited. It's MATLAB. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing like building a like a web application or anything like that. So maybe I knew the very fundamentals and basics enough that I could kind of talk to developers in an educated way, but definitely unqualified to build any type of software product. So how did you deal with it? Because I mean, that's the other thing too. A, you, you're like, okay, I'm scratching my own itch. How much did that cost? And then how much when you started realizing, oh, we've got a lot of customers and now we have to probably be more of a software type company instead of a dabbling type company, right? right. Tell me about that. Yeah. So one thing that worked out really well for us, in hindsight, you know, I, I can identify some things that led to kind of like the success with Jungle Scout. In the time, I would be lying to you if I said that I kind of like knew what I was doing or I did these things on purpose. I just, some of them kind of happened by accident and they uh, worked out well. But one was the first tool that we built was a Chrome extension. And essentially what this Chrome extension did was kind of just automate the process of like filling out a spreadsheet, which I used to be doing manually. And a little bit of the secret sauce there was I had developed algorithms to estimate how well every product on Amazon sells. So it's quite a valuable thing to understand how well any product on Amazon is selling. So the Chrome extension itself was quite simple and basic. So I, uh, I put together like a real good kind of like specification sheet, scoped it out quite well because uh, I knew that was going to be really important. I hired a, let's call it like a, intermediate to senior developer. I had a few projects before that where I tried to hire these pretty junior developers in low cost countries that didn't work out as well. Um, but even hiring a more expensive developer, I think I still only spent like a few thousand dollars on the first MVP of the Chrome extension. But we're talking about extremely basic. It was ugly. It was buggy. It just barely got the job done. Um, but it was convenient enough and gave people the numbers that they were looking for at the time, uh, which was the sales numbers for Amazon to create a little bit of demand. So, you know, like looking in hindsight, the thing that I did really well is I created something very, very simple and basic to start. Uh, I sold that and then reinvested profits from day one into doing more work on it and continuing to grow it because it's, a uh, yeah, like in, in hindsight, it's pretty clear, but, uh, that's why most software companies have to raise money or do raise money is because they're trying to build something fairly complex, like right from the get go, where my thing was really simple. And your secret sauce was really the algorithm. Why even share the algorithm? Wouldn't people be like, oh, now you have better data than somebody else? Why don't or or sell it for a lot more money or you know what I mean? Why do this? Yeah, I um, I think my whole like entrepreneurial life, I've never really had like the mindset of uh, keeping my business secrets or anything like that. Like I'm a very just like transparent and kind of like open person. And at the end of the day, I think that is like the best way to go because the fact of the matter is all these businesses, they're difficult, they're real work, like sharing a few little secrets or whatever. That's not like the one thing this person needs, you know, to like uh, for their business to beat mine. The reality of it's a lot of hard work and grind and challenges associated with it. So I don't think I was too concerned about sharing it. Looking back, if I would have sold the data just to like bigger brands and bigger companies that have more money, uh, we probably would have made a lot more money and the business would probably actually be bigger than what it is today. But to be honest, I was just, uh, I didn't know how to do that. Never been in sales. These sales cycles for these larger companies are uh, much different than anything that I knew or was used to. So I, yeah, I just wasn't smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love that answer. Just so you know, I don't know that I've laughed out loud that, that. <laughs> be because most people will be like, well, there were reasons why we didn't go down this. You're like, eh, didn't really know. I just kept going. Yeah, I didn't know how to do that. It's too hard. <laughs> it's too hard. Everyone hates you right now. They're like, you suck. 225,000 customers. Oh, it's too hard. All right. So, so take me along the way on some of the challenges. Cause I know everybody, when they hear the beginning, they're like, oh, he sucks. Great. Go him. It was easy. I just did whatever I knew at the time. Right. So tell me about some of the really crappy times, especially with that fast of a growth tra trajectory. I know everybody wants that or says they want that. And then when you're mm. in it, you're like, oh, okay. Fast growth is about personal growth also. So tell me about mm. that. Yeah, I'd say the two buckets of like the the majority of my sleepless nights would be the one bucket was concerns about Amazon and what they thought about this and our relationship with them. So that caused a lot of sleepless nights. And the other bucket would be uh, people problems and specifically, you know, employees of the company. Um, because like back then I was like a pretty uh, poor people manager, uh, as a lot of entrepreneurs are. And I... I'd say like in the early days of the business, you know, we were hiring a lot of individuals that were like really scrappy and generalists and just figured out ways to just like get things done, but maybe didn't have any like specialist skill sets. And we also weren't really hiring uh, people with people management experience. And that actually, it works quite well when it was, you know, like a half dozen people, maybe even like up to 10 people. But after that, not having any good people managers and me not being a very good manager myself, it caused a lot of problems. So it was like just very disorganized and no one really knew what to do. And there was poor accountability. And I mean, we were making stuff happen, but it was just this very just uh, chaotic situation that, <laughs> you know, it was just like we were just figuring out ways to make things happen. But it was last minute and it was thrown together or whatever else. Um, so I'd say like that, I think, was a little bit of like a challenging point, let's say like 10 or a dozen people. I remember this happening again when it got to like 30 or 40 people. This time is the same thing. It came down to like uh, management of people. Uh, but this time we I started to need like a little bit of a different caliber of leader or manager inside of the company. Uh, so at that time, you know, we starting to hire some people with management experience, but like they had managed like two or three people and still like fairly young or inexperienced. And then the so that you know when it got to like 30 or 40 again this kind of the same thing started to happen and that's when i realized i needed to kind of like up level my leadership team to uh these individuals that um they're more like proper vp or c level uh leaders who have managed teams of 50 or 100 people before and had a lot of experience doing it and then that's kind of what got us we wouldn't have been able to get to where we're at today without kind of like taking that step so yeah a lot of the yeah, a lot of just the sleepless nights were in regards to, yeah, these these people management things. I'm so glad you said that because we're going to unpack that for a while. Because, because as an entrepreneur, at the beginning, you are just you just care about sales and marketing. You're just like, can we just, can we just make some money here? Can yeah, we just totally. This out? And even at a handful of people, it's like, okay, we've, we, we, we're one quick team. There's only so many communication paths between them. So mm -hmm. even if you kind of suck at it, it ain't too bad. Uh, so tell me, as you went through those trajectories, what books did you read? Did you did you listen to any podcasts? How did you actually start to get better and know what to do on those lines? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I had any great podcasts for this. I listened to a lot of podcasts, but I don't know if I necessarily have like a go-to one as far as like leadership or management goes. I, I had some mentors that helped me quite a bit, including my dad, who um, is a successful entrepreneur. I I did a lot of reading. So like a few of my favorite ones are like Scaling Up or Radical Candor or there's tons of, you know, like books in that area. But they, yeah, I, I think that those helped a lot, but probably more so actually like the mentors in my life. Did, tell me about that relationship, especially if your dad's done this, but any of your mentors, do you hire them? Do, the, do you be like, hey, guys, do you have a question? Are they partners within it? Like, tell me a little bit more about how you found those mentors specifically. Yeah, so I don't have any, this is something I'm, op I'm open to, but like Jungle Scout doesn't have any formal like advisors that say have shares of the company or anything like that. So these would all be like informal relationships, people that I'm friends with or I look up to quite a bit that have been willing to like, uh, give me some of their time to help with things like this. Of course, like with my dad, it's a little bit different. I'm his son. You know, I, I can call him anytime. But there's a lot of other people too that I, uh, yeah, 
yeah, I would just meet up with say, hey, would you mind getting coffee? Like, I want to talk to you about this type of thing. I also went to a number of different masterminds or kind of like offsite meetups for that type of thing. And a lot of it, I think, was just interacting with other people in similar situations and hearing what's worked, what hasn't worked, how they got through that. So I'd say it was just like a combination of all those things I just named. And that's sort of what it is, right? It's all this all over the place. Who knows what thread went where and how we actually got it to here where we are now. And when we go in hindsight, it makes it more difficult. But I bet, and I'm wondering, when you grew up with your dad who was a successful entrepreneur, and one of the things that we found on the show is that <laughs> you're you're more successful younger if you had entrepreneurial parents, right? So mm -hmm. you failed faster. Like, tell me about your journey growing up as a kid whose dad was a sex successful entrepreneur. Did you always know you wanted to do it? Did you learn from him when you were little? Yeah, great question. I think I've like had the entrepreneurial spirit my whole life. I, if you ask my mom that, I think she would tell you the same thing. I grew up with two brothers and, uh, you know, neither of them started their own businesses or entrepreneurs. And I think just like my whole life, I just had more of this like entrepreneurial spirit. I was always wanting to like sell things or I started a few little businesses when I was younger that were, that are kind of interesting. Ooh, what, but, wait, what are they? What were kind of interesting? <laughs> I want to know well, what you did. My favorite one was I was... 14 years old and I had this before there were electric scooters <laughs> there were these motorized scooters called gopeds I don't know if you ever remember these or saw them but I couldn't drive yet because I was 14 years old I so both myself and a lot of my friends had these gopeds and they're gas-powered little scooters and I was like man it'd be really cool if there was a way to put like a key on here so that no one could just like walk up to it and start it and like ride it away so I built this little key system <laughs> And it worked. I sold a few to my friends. And like I said, like this, I have had like this entrepreneurial spirit. So I was like, man, I should start selling these to GoPed stores. So I was 14 years old. This is, this is why I love this story is my uh, marketing channel was if you went to GoPed's website, they didn't give you, I mean, this was kind of before email was very big, but there was no emails on the site, but there were uh, phone numbers, uh, <laughs> fax numbers, and like the address. So I actually, I put together like a one page flyer advertising my goods and I faxed, <laughs> I faxed all these GoPed uh, dealers one by one, like this one page. Like I was sitting at my parents' fax machine, I would type in the phone number, then like put the sheet through and then I type in the next one and I put the sheet through. But funny enough, it led to like in the first like day or two, I, uh, they had, I had sold like, I think it was like 200 or 300 units of this little package that I put together. And then I had to fill out how to, I had to figure out how to fulfill all these orders. So my mom drove me around to like all the radio shacks because I needed like these different parts. It's so like we would buy out a whole radio shack of the parts I needed and she would take me to a different one. I'd buy all those out. <laughs> and I, yeah, so 14 year old, I was like, I was packing these and uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And it was funny, like a, a year ago, I found, I still, my website that I built was still on like the Wayback Machine or the internet archives, pedkey.com. You can check it out. <laughs> Okay, that really was way more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Because <laughs> usually it's like lemonade stand or like, I mean, there's typical. So you've been finding re random niches in <laughs> random markets your entire life. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Wow. Okay, that's really interesting. So tell me a little bit more then about failure. Because I know, especially fear of failure, and when you're a kid, it seems like, oh, well, let's just give something a try. But as you've gone through... Did you always have that? Was it innate? You just tested things like nothing or have you had fear of failure also? Mm. I'd say mild uh, fear of failure. So, you know, like for example, when I, so I, I got a job working as a civil engineer, I ended up quitting that to uh, run my physical products business. And I was, I remember I was pretty terrified when I quit. So my business was making more money than what I was making as an engineer. And as I spoke to my wife about it, I was like, man, I'm ready to just take this thing full time. I hate my job. The business is doing quite well. But I remember it was still pretty scary. And I think you have a lot of irrational fears like, oh, you know, if I quit and I don't work as a civil engineer for the next year, I'll never be able to get another job as an engineer. It's like, man, that's not true. You could easily go back and get that job if you wanted. Or So I think I definitely had some fears. Most of them were irrational. And but I would say it wasn't enough to stop me or I just like I just wanted to be a successful entrepreneur so bad that I was willing to take that. How do you counteract those fears? So they come up. What do you do? Just feel like shut up. <laughs> like what do you do internally or just keep going and ignore them or what's your 
What's your basis? Now what I do is I try to think about like what's what's like the worst case scenario because oftentimes if you think about something that you're scared of or that I'm losing sleep about or whatever else and you actually think what is the worst case scenario there and it's like oh actually that's not really that bad maybe it will cost me a little bit of money or maybe it leads to like something that's a pain but actually most of the worst case scenarios aren't even really that bad so I think that's how I do it now I don't think I was as good about thinking about that back then, you know, like towards the beginning of starting this business. But yeah, that's how I think about it now. Do you, so I do this too. I remember when I quit my job and I was like, I'm going to end up in a van by the river, right? Like yeah. that's what the thing is, right? And then you go through the 17 steps and go, I could, my mom would probably let me stay at her house. So I probably don't have to <laughs> totally. sleep in a van by the river. Did you, did you actually like write it out or you just went there in your mind? I just want to break it down because when people get stuck in that, it seems so simplistic for some, not simplistic, but it seems easier for you than it is for most. Most people get stuck in a loop on what that fear of fear failure is and they keep going to that. And it seems like you can get past it really quick. So that's why I'm asking. Would you? Right. Do? I think that's probably a little bit of my personality type, like a fairly optimistic about most. Oh yeah. I'd say actually I'm very optimistic about just life and everything kind of in general. I don't write the fears down. It does help me to talk to someone about it, but to be honest, I'm not really that good at that. I, a lot of times I'll just like think about it through like loops in my head, but I do know that if I speak to someone about it and like try to, them, to describe the fears to them, even actually just saying it out loud, actually probably if there even wasn't someone that you were saying it to, that's probably when you were like, oh, actually these fears aren't that big of a deal. So you seem like you know yourself really well. So when we when you're going through that much of a tremendous growth in your company, usually there's like shifting of roles, right? And it's like, oh, mm. well, Greg is the this guy. I'm not totally the CEO. So what are your strengths and how did you learn them as you went through? Because we know you're good at finding niches in random or trends in random <laughs> places, but do you even do that right now? Like what is what is your role right now and how have you learned your strengths along the way in the last five years? Yeah, I'd say in the past, let's say years when I feel like I stepped into like a proper CEO role. And a big piece of that is hiring like a full executive team. So I have a full uh, C-suite or uh, VPs underneath me that run their uh, respective areas. It definitely wasn't always like that. You know, in the early days, I was a one man show, did everything. So I still know every aspect of the business quite well. Um, and I'd say I was like, ex I'd say I was very, very involved, even probably to the point where I was making a lot of <clears throat> employees upset with kind of everything that was going on up until it was probably like 25 or 30 people. And then after that, I started to get a little bit better at stepping out of the areas that I wasn't good at or didn't enjoy in the business. And the two areas that I, I would say that my skill set's best for that and that I enjoy the most is like with the product and the marketing stuff. So I don't like all of the, the operations. Um, I actually really enjoy talking to customers, but it's too like um, repetitive for me to do customer support. Uh, there's, you know, there's areas of the business that I just don't enjoy as much or is not as good at. But yeah, I like the marketing and the product stuff the best. So that's what I would still be the most involved with today. But I try to be really careful about not getting involved too deep because otherwise I tur usually turn into a bottleneck. So, okay, let's break that piece down then too because what I see happen a lot, especially with quick growth, is going all in and then micromanaging almost. Like being like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm – I like being needed. I really, I really want you to know what my opinion is on these things, right? Especially because yeah. you're the owner of the company. So how did you learn to sort of step back and not micromanage and let go? Not only for the stuff that you know you're not good at, because that's a little bit easier. Sure, you're better at it than I am. But the stuff that you know you're kind of pretty good at or you want your flavor in it, how do you actually let go? Because I feel like letting go is one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs to do, even when they know they're supposed to. Right. I think a big piece of that comes down to hiring people and working with them uh, who are like really smart and really good at the whatever craft they're doing and them just building up enough trust with you that it's like, wow, this person can do it either 80% as good as I can or maybe even better. And at that point, I think it's not that difficult for me to let go. If it, like looking back, the, the times it was most difficult for me to let go. I think part of it was I didn't quite have the right person in the role or or they just kind of weren't trained well enough. And now I think it's easier because, you know, I'll be talking to our chief product officer and you're like after an hour, I'm like, damn, actually 
most of your ideas are quite a bit better than mine. Let me just get out of your way. <laughs> <laughs> Repetition. So that makes like, it oh, a lot easier. Oh, yep. Nope. Not as smart as I thought I was. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, sir. But, so but I think that's a big piece of it. I, I'd say like the other, other thing real quick is um, the other thing that I've realized is there are some things that I would do differently. Like if I get a little bit too involved with the weeds, but the other thing I have to remind myself of is just because I would do it differently doesn't necessarily mean that like that's the better or that's the right way. Most of these decisions you're making, you don't really know the outcome or like whose idea is better anyway. And so I think that's part of it too. I think like, man, I would have done that a little bit differently, but Actually, I have no idea if that was even the best way to go about it. Right. We just think we're really smart in our heads. No, I bet mine would have been yeah. better. Of course it would have been better. <laughs> that makes my ego feel really good. Uh, so tell me about the hiring. So I feel like that's another key piece that you've learned a massive amount on because um, when people come to me, they're like, well, is this is it me because I'm a bad manager? Is it my employee because I – Maybe I hired wrong, but maybe it's mm-hmm. them. Maybe I'm not giving them enough training. There's so many nuances in gray area. So how have totally. can you give us any tips or anything that you have to be able to help somebody listening going, I feel you. I wish I could trust the system and back away and know that they're better, but we're not there yet. What do I do? Yeah, I think so much of it's about like the recruiting and the interview process, right? And it's an easy trap to fall in. I've been very guilty of this in the past too, being like, oh, I'm too busy. So I don't have time to do more interviews or more recruiting or whatever else. But that's really kind of the make or break point, you know, like when you're doing the recruiting and the interviewing. So, you know, I'd say just be very diligent, be very, yeah, just methodical about it. Make sure you're doing plenty of interviews that you have enough candidates. Uh, Because most of my, I think like poor hiring decisions are the people that didn't work out. Most sometimes actually it just, I just, you know, thought the person was going to be better than what they were for some other reason didn't work out. But a lot of them were probably just too rushed. We're like, man, we really need someone in this seat right now. Like we're, we're, you know, we're underwater, whatever. And when we try to kind of like rush someone into that role, whereas the ones that have been much more methodical have a much higher percentage of working out. And then the other tip I'll give to this is, this is, an, is applicable for the listeners who you know have small business, only a few people working for them. But another real game changer for me was hiring a in-house recruiter. So prior to that, the most of the time it was me, but otherwise it was like the hiring manager. So like our marketing manager would be doing the recruiting and the interviewing. They would have to do their own recruiting, and that was a big piece of it. And what happens is same thing. Like they're busy, you know, they've spent. Like, 20 hours doing recruiting or like going through resumes and doing the interviewing and whatever else. And they're kind of just like a little bit burnt out. They're like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find someone better. But the reason that hiring a recruiter really changes the game is now for any uh, job opening we have, like there's just an endless pipeline. Like we actually have two recruiters now. They're both really good. So no one ever feels like, oh, if I turn this person down that there won't be more coming. It's like, you can just say no a hundred times in a row and they'll send you a hundred and first candidate, you know? So that just is a huge game changer because then people don't uh, just kind of like settle for someone because they're kind of sick of recruiting people. I'm so happy that you said that. Everybody that's listening is like, you suck again. You have two recruiters. But <laughs> but the, yeah. po- the point way of the story, two right? Like how amazing is that? The point of the story is that or to me for for interpretation for all the people that have a lower level is that's exactly what happens it sort of gets put on like the third piece of your priority list and because you start like going uh, I don't know, right? The idea of always having someone on. Exactly. And you've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Like it's yeah. too much, right? And so because even though, even though you know that the person you're going to hire, if they're good, will actually help you. It's the it's the massive upfront cost, right? Of, of time and energy and that sort of thing. Um, right. But your attitude of going, can you just imagine just having qualified candidates just coming through the door and you can systemize a lot of that people. So you don't need a recruiter. You can systemize so much more than what they're probably doing on their own right now, just so you guys know. Um, but it's, it's freeing to know that you can build the company in the way that you want instead of going like, well, I can take what I can get because that's all I can afford or find or whatever it is. Cause there's amazing people in this world as I'm assuming you realize, right? Right. Even if I, you know, if I were to do it all over again, you know, back when we were like three or four people, I think, especially for a little bit more important roles, like even just like a marketing manager that was going to manage my, you know, like three people on the marketing team or something, 
I would actually probably, if I were to do it all over again, hire a recruiter even for some of those roles. Like recruiters are quite expensive. Like, uh, I'm talking about like a contract recruiter because yep. they usually take 20, 30% of the first year salary. So it actually is a lot of money, but it's just so important to get these good candidates and they save you a lot of money. All right, excuse me, uh, save you a lot of time. Or the other thing that I would do if I were to do it all over again is hire uh, kind of like more of like a VA type role in the Philippines or wherever else that was like relatively low cost and just have them do kind of like the recruiting or the outreach for me because that really is like a very important part of it. And you don't you don't obviously have to have a full time in-house person to you know do the recruiting. I love this. And I just feel like people sort of, because it's not their strength, put it on the, the back burner. And then as the company's growing, because they're focusing on sales and marketing, they're like, yeah, this is great. Oh, shoot. And then the hiring just sort of is the last thing. And that's, you know, the huge fuel that, I mean, 225 people you've said over four and a half years? Or no? Oh, there's 125 people 100, that work at Jungle Scout now. 225,000 customers. That's what it was. 125 yeah. people in four and a half years. Right. So yeah, we've probably hired maybe 175, 100, yeah, between 150 and 175 people probably. Thank you for saying lot. that. <laughs> Thank you for saying, oh, we didn't get it right every single time. Good to know. No, we yeah, awesome. definitely didn't. <laughs> how quick, how did you learn to fire fast then? And were you the guy that was always like going, yes, they need to go? And were you good at hiring fast? Or give me some tips on that. I think I'm better about it today, but I, I'm still like a little bit of a, a softy. You know, I like just care about people's feelings and emotions too much. And these people become my friends quickly and I feel bad about it. You know about their families or whatever else. It's like a really hard thing to do, right? The, I think a little bit of the turning point for me was, you know, we fired like one person and people like, oh yeah, no surprise. And then two and three. And, you know, then after you kind of like get down the road a little bit, it's like every single time the rest of the team is essentially like what took so long or I didn't, yeah, I saw that coming from a mile away. So it's like, wait a second, like everyone else on the team thinks they should be fired. And like, I'm so worried about them being like, oh, now this is an unstable place to work or whatever else. But what it comes down to is high performers don't want to work with people who aren't carrying their weight or are low performers. You know, it's like they very, you know, it's like for one minute, they're like, oh, that person was fun to go to happy hour with. But thank God we'll get someone in here that actually does their fair share of work. <laughs> and like everyone gets over it so quickly. And I was like, wow, there's actually nothing I have to worry about here that all of the best people in the company don't mind at all about people getting fired and they actually like it. And that's actually like how we retain them. So after I kind of made that realization for myself, I think that's when I'm now like a little bit more critical about it and I'm more easily able to put my like feelings and emotions aside about it. I love this. Okay. Give me process or, or tips on what you're actually looking for in the deciding factors of hiring. Do you do key indicators? Do you do like reports, quarterly reports? Give me a little bit more about how you make that decision. Cause if everybody else knows, how do you find out as soon as they do? Right? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, it is fairly difficult, right? I, I think that's like one of the challenging things is it's like, man, is this person going to be good? And like, they're just learning a little bit slower or like it, it feels easy to always kind of make excuses why it's not just not quite working out yet because almost every time or, there's been a few instances where it was just very, very clearly it wasn't a cultural fit or like for some other reason, like we screwed up when we knew it within the first week. There's been like a few of those, but most of them are like, this person's decent. They're just quite a bit worse than other people doing a similar role. You know what I mean? And those are like the little bit harder ones because it's not as just like clear cut. Mm. So yeah, I'd say it varies quite a bit by the role or what the person's doing. Um, you know, like now we definitely lean on the managers uh, to kind of be thinking about those things or making those decisions. Let's see, how else do we kind of, or I'm trying to think how else I've kind of like thought about it in the past. You know, yeah, I guess like after you have multiple people doing the same role, it usually becomes really clear. It's like, wow, this person um, is able to, you know, get twice as many backlinks as what this person is. Or like, wow, this developer, you know, gets three times as many uh, stories done as the other one. But like when it's only one, it's a little bit harder, especially if you're not uh, great at that particular skill set. So I don't know if I have any secret tricks or hacks or something like that. Uh, I think a lot of just comes down to judgment and working with them. Mm, 
-hmm. How much of a chance do you give them? Like, if it's not that clear cut where you're like, I know I'm asking you questions, you're like, crap, Jamie, I don't know. Uh, but, but when you when you look at like how much time you give them, is it like, are we talking about a month, two months, three months for the training side to be like, okay, or are we talking six months to a year by the time you're like, okay, this is not really a fit. What's your higher fast quote unquote yeah. metric? Honestly, right now it's probably like three to six months, but I would say that's not very good that yeah, like looking back out of all those people, we really knew it the first month or two months. We're just, uh, yeah, just kind of soft or worried about, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're just worried about the emotional, like the friendship yeah. side of it. I think that's why they go on. That's why it, it was like every time people are like, oh, what took so long? <laughs> well, and people wrestle with that in their head, like, because they care about, I, and that's an amazing thing to care about a human, right? And yeah. it's so cool to hear you say, because there are people right now listening to this going through that stuff. And every time in hindsight, usually it's like, why didn't I fire them a lot faster? And I'm just bringing it up right now, people. Let's listen to it right now. I mean, I had to have my bookkeeper tell me like three times before I fired somebody because I was like, but I love her, but I, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I know, right? Slap somebody around so that way it actually uh, it actually can take the leap to be able to do it because it does take a while but like it sounds like you are right now you get good at it not that you want to but you get good at it you get good at both sides the hiring and the firing and therefore you can have a company that has a stable culture that you've built over so long so before we start wrapping up I know I have to ask the last question in just a minute but what what one thing has really made a huge difference in your growth trajectory do you think as a software as a service company you've you've I mean, it's insane growth. What one thing really made all the difference? If I were trying to like distill it down to just one thing, I, I would say it is the like the like the persistence and the drive to you know, like shoot for a goal and just not stop at anything to achieve it. Because I had like no idea how to build software or do the marketing or whatever else. Like one of the yeah. one of the only attributes that I say I am good at is just uh, like this like persistence that never take no as an answer. Like run through any obstacle. If you tell me it can't be done, it just makes me want to do it that much more. And I think it's really like that drive, especially like in the earlier days that uh, got it off the ground. And I'd say like it, we're trying. Uh, I I think I've done a pretty good job at like. In, uh, instilling that same culture all throughout Jungle Scout. So, yeah, you know, I think everyone has the, the culture or like the the mindset of like, no, we can definitely do that. You know, like maybe it doesn't look like it's feasible on paper or whatever else, but we're just going to find a way to make it happen. And I think that's like a really special thing for a company to have and really important because the just like the the human spirit is a really incredible thing that you are able to just make things happen when it doesn't seem possible like if your back's up against the wall okay i have a follow up question to that cuz i liked it so much okay so was the initial goal this big was it always 225,000 or more was it always huge or did it incrementally get bigger and bigger as you saw the future incrementally it got bigger i think i've set a goal and achieved it for like Jungle Scout success a whole bunch of times by now, which just goes to show that I guess I need to set my sights higher. That must be an awesome feeling being like, oh, let's create another big one. Okay, let's create another big <laughs> one. That's really, really cool. All right. So I know we have to start wrapping up. So the last question, what is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? If you have that person that you've been hesitant to fire, but you know it's the right thing, I think you should go ahead and just pull the trigger. It'll hurt for an evening, but drink a glass of wine, go to bed, and you'll feel better the next day. Best advice ever. <laughs> Seriously, that's exactly what I tell my clients. And I totally, totally agree. It's the little band-aid that feels a million times better the next day. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your fast growth. Where do we find all about Jungle Scout and everything that you do online? Yeah, if you're interested in selling on Amazon or have an Amazon business, you want to scale it up, check out Jungle Scout. There's a lot of free resources. We do a whole bunch of cool case studies and tons of free content. So that'd be the place to uh, do so. If you want to follow me personally, the best place to find me is on Instagram, G underscore Mercer. I'm pretty active on there. Awesome. And we'll definitely link up everything so that way everyone can follow you. I hope you have an absolute amazing day. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Jamie. It's been fun.
If you enjoy this show, I would really appreciate your wonderful words of feedback. Go leave me a review. I would love a rating. Whatever you can do in the time that you've got, I would so appreciate it.